Kushu everyone, Kimblazer Indigenous Kaz, Anishinaabe Kwe and Dao, Gawababi Bonikag, and Don Chaba. Yat a she Matthew J. Skeets in his chair, Sinajin in the Schlin, Squabah Bush's chin, Scotchy Dash Che, Do Torgoj and Dashinel. I'm Kim Blazer, I'm Anishinaabe from the White Earth Nation of Minnesota. I'm the founding director of INAPO, Indigenous Nations Poets. Welcome to Songs at the Confluence, Indigenous Poets on Place. Hello, everybody. My name is Jake, and I'm coming to you from Sale, Arizona, on the Navajo Nation, where I teach and live. On behalf of INAPO, Jake Skeets and I have worked with Tippett Rice Arts Center and the Adrian Brinkerhoff Poetry Foundation to put together tonight's programming. We'd like to thank all those who have contributed to this event, including the Academy of American Poets and the wonderful group of Indigenous poets who share their work. From my understanding, this is the first time that an anthology like this has ever been constructed and published. The Norn Anthology here spans generations of Native and Indigenous poets all across this land. So for me, what I hope it paints and illustrates to an American reader is the variety and range that Native and Indigenous poets take. What this volume offers is a gathering of the work of tribal poets and song makers across generations. Some of the early work has been translated from indigenous languages and oral performances. Some of the poets included had their first book last year. The variety will challenge stereotypes of what indigenous poetry is or should be. There are so many different types of poets here, so many different types of poetry, so many different types of songs. And they are all necessary and important. They all represent this thing that we call native or indigenous poetry. Indigenous poetry exists as a body of work to be wrestled with on its own terms. The volume was arranged around regions, recognizing the importance of place to indigenous poetry and indigenous peoples. Energy exists within the landscape and that energy communicates with poets, and poets then are the medium, the vehicle. They are the antenna, as Jack Spicer would put it. And we translate that energy onto the page through poetry. Our program today includes a handful of poets who are featured in the anthology, sharing both poems and a glimpse of the places that impact their work. But I also hope that we're able to somewhat conjure a relationship back with land and landscape. And for me, this anthology is a start to remind people that we come from places, we come from spaces, we come from the universe. In these poems, you will see a taste of Indigenous poetry as place-centered poems as world makers. There is this gathering, there is a confluence kind of, of native poetry, native forms, native songs and dreams and visions and craft and work and labor and language. Perhaps the most important impact I anticipate from the book is it will become an invitation for other native poets to find their voice and to release their poetry to do its work in the world. Hopefully the future looks like more poetry. More poetry existing in immediate and necessary spaces. Poetry existing in the mainstream. Poetry existing everywhere. I'll be waiting for it. And we at Inepo, Indigenous Nations Poets, will welcome you into our community. Thank you so much to the organizers for this video, for giving us space. I'm humbled and honored to be part of this uh, cohort of readers who have g gifted us such beautiful language, such beautiful songs about place, about moving forward. And thank you so much to Kimberly Blazer, who was a force in getting this together.
Thank you so much. A white earth childhood, water rich and money poor, vaporous beings transformed in cycles, the alluvial stories pulled from Minnesota's lakes, harvested like whitefish, like minomen, like old prophecies of seed growing on water. Legends of Anishinaabe spirit beings, cloud bear or thunderbird who brings us rain, winter windigo like ice woman, or Mishubishu who roars with spit and hiss of rapids, great underwater panther, you copper us to these tributaries of balance, rills, a cosmology of nobi. We believe our bodies thirst, our earth, one element, anabi shabu, tea brown wealth, like maple sap, amber, the liquid eye of moon, now she turns tide and each wetted being gyrates to the sound, its river body curving. We, women of ageless waters, endure like each flower drinks from night, holds dew. Our bodies, a libretto, saturated, an aquifer. We speak words from ancient waters. I thought we could be related, Andy and I. We're both blue walls and yellow cows in a gallery of pristine white. We're both screen prints, offset and layered, underexposed. We're both silver clouds filled with helium and polluted rain. We're both white and blonde and scared of hospitals. Only I'm not really any of those things. And then I thought we could be related, Geronimo and I. We're both code names for assassinations. We're both names you yell when you jump from a plane. We're both gamblers and dead and neon acrylic brush strokes on a screen printed image. Only I'm more like a neon beer sign sputtering in a tavern window, burned out, broke, a heart with arrhythmic beats. Indian, 
Eden, open, tooth, bone, bruise, this town split in two. Clocks ring out as train horns. Each hour hand drags into a screech, iron, steel, iron. The minute hand runs its fingers through the outcrops. Drunk town. Drunk is the punch, town a gasp. In between the letters are boots, crushing tumbleweeds, a tractor tire backing over a man's skull. Men around here only touch when they fuck in a back seat. Go for the foul with 30 seconds left. Hug their sons after high school graduation. Open a keg. Stab my uncle 47 times behind a liquor store. A bar called Eddie's sits at the end of the world. By the tracks, drunk men get some sleep. My father's uncle tries to get some under a long bed truck. The truck backs up to go home. I arrange my father's boarding school soap bones on white space and call it a poem. Like my father, I come upon death, staggering into the house with beer on the breath. Mule deer splintered in barbed tendon, gray highway veins, narrow, push, pull under teal and red hills. A man is drunk staggering into northbound lanes, dollar bills for his index and ring fingers, sands glitter with broken bottles, greens, deep blues, clears, and golds. This place is white cone, greasewood, sanders, whitewater, bread springs, crystal, chinli, naslini, Indian wells, and all muddy roads lead from Gallup. The sky places an arm on the near hills, on the shoulder, dark gray, almost blue, bleeds into greens, blue-greens, turquoise into hazy blue, pure blue, no gray or gold or oil black seeped through. If I stare long enough, I see my uncle in a mirror the bottle caps we use for eyes. An owl has a skeleton of three letters. O twists into L. The burrowing owl burrows under dead cactus. Feathers fall on horseweed and skull bone blown open.
The winding cord of highways, unkempt gravel roads, and the trails of animals. A record of who and what has passed over, an agony of secrets. In the end, they have all borne witness, eyes like glass beads that can never blink. The dull light of motel neon shines ominously. An engine growls across the landscape. Brittle men who are splintered like glass thrown from a second story window and we are the room they leave behind. They are pathetic husks, feeble in spirit. Fragments fall along the fields and shallow ditches in overlooked alleyways or underpasses. A cold, empty breeze rising from the debris, the first and last moment of her. It is rage that pulls her up from this place. She spews out the wretched and miserable as particles of dawn-lit soil illuminate her skin. Her hair is a two-edged sword. She stitches together the collective story of origin, her body a map descended from the stars on the backs of animal sisters carried to safety in a bird's beak. Outside our home, pregnant sprawl of American war and selective memory, protrusion of concrete roadway, white bar hovering over the rusted wrecks of turrets, barnacled oil bunkers, torpedo blisters, local amano drained, filled to build the naval yard, docked battleships in service, moku ume ume enclosed, metal earth mover claws, hooks ever ready to ravage Avalao under the great white ball of Pakong. Sure enough, there are tourists there too, snapping like starved triggerfish. The white uniform naval guides might be telling them now, the USS Arizona was a 608 foot super dreadnought that entombs 1,777 men. They might salute the sunken ship, the dead soldiers, and ask for a moment of silence. They will not say the ship has been leaking two to nine quarts of oil every day for the past 75 years, or that since World War II, the military has stored its toxic waste in the water where it has leaked into groundwater wells, or that there are over 700 documented areas of contamination, or that bunker fuel and other petroleum waste have been leaking from a tank farm into an underground plume of 5 million gallons measuring over 20 acres or that mercury is in the soil, or pesticides, dry cleaning fluids, and metal residues from the open burning of ordinances in the soil, or asbestos scrap, polychlorinated biphenyls, paints, and solvents are in the soil, or tetrachloroethene and hydrocarbons in storm drains, or that in Iea, where we live, we are close enough to hear the 8 a.m. Star Spangled Banner blaring, and our people may be walking, our children may be playing, we may be giving birth, we may be bathing, drinking, we may be eating, we may be breathing without knowing, and we may be dying. They might end the moment of silence for soldier sacrifice, saluting their flag over Pu'uloa, monstrous womb.
the Muskogee's Hopki Fushki Loch Ness monster, traveled here by the camp of the Sack and Fox. Through the alluvial gumbo soil, flailing, thrashing, uprooting giant trees, plowed deep with its sharp breast. Come to rest by Tuskegee Town, buried itself in a lake of mud to rest. The warriors of Tustanagi were ordered to shoot it with a silver-tipped arrow. With a great roar and upheaval, the snake moved on, winding by Okmogi to enter Octahutchee, South Canadian River. Thus his plowed journey, the creeks called Hudji Sofki, Deep Fork River. One Shalaka observed the snake had hypnotic power, could draw a person into a swirling whirlpool. It made a sound like a tinkling silver bell. Oh, geese. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Leanne. Good to see you. It's good to see you. My gosh, how many years have we been working together? Several. I think um, two, was it, is it three years? Three years. Yeah. Three years. We started working on this anthology, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. Yeah. It's so exciting. And given that much of the process involved what we're doing now, we were all in different parts of the country um, and we'd have to meet on phone and Zoom and Skype and all kinds of things. Only once were we able to get together in person. And we met as editorial groups out of regions, mm -hmm. which was very exciting. And then you were right. I think we only came together once in Santa Fe to really talk through the anthology. And that was a big meeting. People came from all over the United States um, to, to really make sure that we brought this, uh, brought love and lightness and gravitas into this, into this book. My favorite part of the anthology or aspect of the anthology is how it's organized. It's organized by five different regions. I've been involved in other anthologies and that is not really the, it, we don't start with land. I love the idea of having it regionally. Um, it brought up a lot of questions of place. Um, what is it that defines certain groups from certain parts of the country? Knowing that there is nothing, there's nothing common necessarily, but there is that shared sense of place. I'm, I am so proud and so proud to be associated with this project. It, I think it will also live on as an anthology for years to come. Well, I think one of the really unique things about it is that it spans four centuries. You know, there's there are a lot of really wonderful anthologies of Native literature. This is definitely one of many, and I, I for one, have learned from all of them. You know, I've been reading those anthologies since I was a teenager, and that's how I came to know so many writers. Um, but what's so unique about this is the span of time, four centuries. We have early Native women writers, uh, Zikala Shaw, Elsie Fuller, um, Emily Pauline Johnson. You know, women writing in the 18th century, 18th, 19th century. Uh, we have a range of styles and forms. We have um, Chief Seattle's speech, 
We have kind of a concrete poem from Wayne Westlake, Hawaiian's <laughs> Fish. Right. Uh, we have John Trudell's lyrics, Diablo Canyon. Um, so it's also, it, it ranges styles and it ranges time and people. What's your favorite poem? Oh, again, I have a lot. Um, but I think one thing I've been returning to lately is actually the title poem of the book, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, which I think is so appropriate right now, uh, the time in which this book is being released into the world. And this is, um, that title line is actually, it's from um, the poem or, or the Hawaiian creation chant uh, called the Kumulipu, Kumulipo. Um, and the version that we included here um, was written under the dire direction of King David. At the time that turned the heat of the earth, at the time when the heavens turned and changed, at the time when the light of the sun was subdued, to cause light to break forth, at the time of the night of Makali'i, then began the slime which established the earth, the source of deepest darkness, of the depth of darkness, of the depth of darkness, of the darkness of the sun in the depth of night. It is night, so was night born. That's beautiful. Really, really beautiful. I like to think of this anthology as that kind of a seed. Um, it will only bring out more poems and more poets and more dancers. Someone asked me about um, Native writers. And I said, well, you know, I don't think I've ever met a Native who wasn't writing and telling stories and telling poems. The book and the anthology captures that, um, that very simple lesson that Native people are in and of themselves storytellers and writers and poets. This anthology wanted to be born and we are the uh, the midwife, the, the, the mothers who mothered the book in with the help of great students, great collaborators, people who were helpers, and we all created this book now. I wanted to read this one poem by uh, Gladys Cardiff. It's called To Frighten a Storm. Oh, now you come in rut in rank and black desire to beat the brush, to lash the wind with your long hair. Ha! I am afraid, exceedingly afraid. But see, her path goes there along the swaying tops of trees up to the hills. Too long she is alone. Bypass our fields and mount your ravages of fire and rain on higher trails. You shall have her lying down upon the smoking mountains. Mm. I just love that. I do too. That's a beautiful poem. So Leanne, what do you, now that the anthology is out in the world, what do you hope for it? I think this book is a primer for the future. And it, it, at the same time, it's also a wonderful underpinning of the, of the Native poets who have, have been before us and standing uh, beside us and uh, holding us up as we, as we become fully realized Native writers. Uh, we have so many ancestor poets, ancestor writers who have taught us how to live in this world and how to uh, help help the future um, come into view. So that's what I think this this book is. It's a it's a it's a guide. I agree. A spirit guide and a and a flesh and blood guide. I agree.
yellow roses, wild roses. Their decades of growth, a fierce fence between the drunkenness of my neighbors and me. I have known some badass skins, cliched bad to the bone Indians who were maybe not bad, but just broke and broken for sure. Late winter, late nights, a gentle rapping, a tapping on my chamber door. Some guy selling a block of commodity cheese for five bucks. You climbed a tree, sat there for hours until some kind of voice called you back home. You unfolded your wings, took to the air and smashed into earth. They hauled you to ER, then detox, where they laughed at your broken wings. Once I thought I saw eagles soar, loop and do the crow hop in the blue air while the sun beat the earth like a drum. But I was disheveled and drinking those years. Indians and the internet. Somewhere, sometime. Whenever a Messiah chief is born, jealous relatives will drag him down like the old days, only instantly now. In a brutal land, within a brutal land, with corrupt leaders and children killing themselves, we know who is to blame. But we are on a train, a runaway train, and we don't know what to do. The good earth, the sun blazing down, us and our chones, butts stuck in inner tubes, floating down a mossy green river, speechless, stunned, silent with joy and sobriety and youth, oh, youth. She smiled at me and got off her horse. She smelled of leather and sweat and her kiss has lasted me 50 years. Bad Indians, do not go to hell. They are marched to the molten core of the sun and then beamed back to their families, purified, whole, and holy as hell. This is the deepest part of the world. Birds don't fly here, but there is the sound of wings. The smell, just a struggle in the earth, underneath the musty floorboards. Monsters hatch fully grown from their eggs. Snaky legs indicate chaos. I carry sad omens. Slobber down the psychic's leg to her feet pointed backwards. I roll off the back of a skull strapped on top of a fox who shapeshifts into the irresistible. A Christian, Oklahoma shaped and melancholic, caught at the entrance of a ditch. As the best breath of me tornadoes into the next county.
heavy-headed sunflower after Dana Levine's field. You watch from the window as I run to a patch of sunflowers. Or maybe I am running out of the house, around the garage, into a patch of sunflowers when I run into a lion. Beautiful yellow petals, lush golden mane, inflorescence of jaw unhinged, blooming toward a cloudless blue sky an annulus of yellow teeth, a ring of yellow flame burning around the neck, corona of eclipse. We're confrontation of sun and moon, you standing in the window of this birch skin house, me a sunflower, neck bent and heavy headed, can you see the seeds being shook from this jauntest eye that never blinks? Or are you closing the shutters? Do you think it is the rain? Hi everyone. Hi. We're Kathy and Peter, the founders of Tippett Rice Art Center and Adrian Brinkerhoff Poetry Foundation. We're all here to celebrate Joy Harjo's anthology of Native Nations poetry. When the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. To have dreams, you have to start with words. And to have certain kinds of words, you have to have dreams. When you put them together, dreams and words, you get poetry. We'd like to thank Kim and Jake, Jennifer and Leanne, Sai and Laylee, Brandy and ML, and everyone at INAPO for the readings today. For the reminder that dreams speak to us in the special words of poetry, which now have Joy Harjo's Norton Anthology to release them into the air like spirits. And to arise, we live in those spirits, in the cubist fragments of an immense painting, a cyclorama, where the spirits of the sky descend to blanket us in our sleep and give us what Kimberly Wensot calls our seasonal souls. Through land and sky, through canyons and grasslands, our seasons continue. As Kim Blazer has written, it's a poetry of continuance. And as long as poetry continues our dream songs, we will be, as Adrian Lewis wrote in Skinology, stunned silent with joy. To everyone who has organized and performed and joined this wonderful celebration, and to everyone on our Tippet Rise and Brinkerhoff teams who has put so much work into this wonderful event. Amy and Amanda, Lindsay, Jean, Monty, Jim, and James, we thank you all for making the confluence audible and visible. And thank you everyone who's with us today. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.